own sin, from the sin of others, from the circumstance of a broken world. God doesn't run from our messy lives. We sometimes believe God's love isn't big enough for our mess. We remember that God's love is steadfast for us. We look back and remember that God didn't flee from the messiness of humanity, but entered into it. We trust that God is faithful to enter into the messiness of our lives, too. We remember that God became a vulnerable human out of great love for humanity, entering into a messy family line to bring about redemption, hope, and peace. Our brokenness is restored to wholeness and peace through Christ's working in our lives. We repent, we confess, we lament, and we open ourselves up to Christ because we know he is faithful to forgive us and we can have peace and wholeness through him. We receive the assurance that we are forgiven. We receive the promise of peace and wholeness through Christ. As we light the fourth candle, we ask God to bring us true peace and wholeness, confessing our brokenness and messiness before God. God did not flee the mess of humanity, but entered into it as a baby, that we might remember that God will not flee our brokenness either, but that God loves us and restores us in the midst of it. Well, good morning and Merry Christmas. Well, you could do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. All right, that's, that's good. You're awake. It, it, um, it's Christmas Eve tomorrow morning. Uh, I'm going to say between 2 and 3 a.m. I'll be up. The only time of the year my wife gets up early. She'll be getting me up. Well, you get up early every day, but not that early. Hey, this uh, has been a wonderful day thus far. I went to Sunday school this morning, and it was incredible. I want to tell you, it was incredible. We, we celebrated Advent and Sunday school, and I heard five good sermons, five good sermons. In fact, I thought as uh, we were concluding Sunday school this morning, I could just go home because they did an incredible job. You missed it if you didn't get to come to Sunday school. So I want to thank all the participants this morning that uh, shared with us the meaning of Advent and each candle, and then leading us into the presence of Jesus. It's truly what uh, this time of the year is about, not just this time of the year, but every day of the year that uh, is about Jesus and the transformation that uh, we enjoy because of him coming into the world, living his life, dying, resurrecting from the grave, and now sitting at the right hand of the Father, uh, but I, uh, as I prayed this morning with our, our worship team, um, he is the Emmanuel. He is the God who is with us today. He is in this room. He is in you if you have accepted him. As we worship this morning, let me remind you, we are not singing to each other. We are singing to him. Let us stand this morning and prepare to worship.
and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. If you can, you may be seated. You're up. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good morning. Um, so Saturday, we are having our second New Year's Eve Christmas slash party. It's going to start at noon, so come, be a part of it, bring food, because we're going to just have good fun, food and fellowship. Bring a White elephant gift, it does not need to be expensive and it can be anything in your house if you wish. Wrap it up, bring it with you. And a mug, something that maybe you're not too fond of and you wanna get rid of or you're just wanting to clean house and just get rid of. Um, bring a mug wrapped and we're gonna have a lot of fun and excitement mm -hmm. on Saturday at noon. It is a lot of fun. If you've never been, I encourage you come and enjoy. It was one of the events that we got to come to last year and I'm looking forward to coming again this year and participating and having fun. We always have fun here at the church with fellowship. I enjoy so much the fellowship that we have. Uh, and one quick announcement for me this morning, tonight at 6.30, we will be having our Christmas Eve service. If you remember last year, we had to cancel. The weather was so bad last year. We have no excuse this year. I understand tomorrow, we're gonna have Florida-like weather. Yay. Yes. Uh, a lot of people are disappointed because we're not having a white Christmas. I'm not one of them. 
Um, also, I, I do want to say this morning before we do spend some time in fellowship, that was Laura and uh, Wanda and I was coming over this morning. Last year, I got to be here for uh, the Christmas service, the Christmas Eve uh, uh, Sunday before Christmas, but I was not officially your pastor. I am this year, and I am so enjoying being your pastor, so thank you. We are truly blessed. Uh, Laura and I both will just uh, continue to express uh, our love for you and uh, the opportunity to be here, to be here, to be the pastors. Uh, let's spend some time in fellowship together. I want to encourage you, if you could, to find your place. And uh, we want to remind you to please take your Christmas cards. Okay? If you would, leave the bag. Just take the cards. And uh, Sherry and I went through ours. And thank you, everybody that gave us Christmas cards. It was really a wonderful thing. As you look up here at the stage, I want you to make sure you don't turn the channel. You're in the right place, okay? <laughs> You're in the right place. Come on and stand with us if you would one more time as we sing this great song to the Lord.
God is here with us. You may be seated. I believe that, that, that God has, has brought the community of believers together to lift up his holy name and to give him praise and to give him thanks. But also I believe that he has brought his people together to encourage each other. One of the, one of the things that just um, encourages my heart is I will uh, be leaving church or during a time of fellowship, I'll look across the room and I'll see people praying for each other. I'm grateful that we are that kind of church that sees the needs of each other and we pray for each other. That's, that's what it's about. And we're here this morning and I just feel like, Lori, I, we need to pray for you this morning. Lori and her sisters brought her mom back up here um, while I was going through some difficulty with her health. We're going to pray, Lori, that uh, God will give you and your sister strength and wisdom and bring healing and, and, uh, and joy uh, to your mom in these days. Uh, I know that if you look in your bulletin, there's a prayer need in there. It's called unspoken. And, and you know, even though it's called unspoken, there are spoken requests. And, and God knows. And I know that you may have some of those. And God knows. Let us, let us pray this morning. You know, I, I believe that when we pray sincerely from our hearts, that it is like if you read it in the book of Luke, when Zechariah goes into the holies of holies, he's lighting incense. These are the prayers of the people. And, and these prayers are a sweet-smelling aroma to God because we are crying out and we are saying, God, I love you and I need you. And God wants to help us in our time of need. Let's pray together. Fathers, we, we come before you this morning. You know, I'm encouraged by that scene that I read in, in your scriptures where, you know, Zechariah, he goes into the temple in the holies of holies and he's, he's lighting candles for the prayers of the people. But the people were outside praying. People were outside praying and they're praying for those needs and they're praying for, for Zechariah. Lord, it's no different today. In our minds, we, uh, we harness time not understanding in your heart and who you are. Uh, there is no time. It's eternal. That it was though, it was just moments ago, that 2,000 years ago, that you became flesh and came into the world to live among us. Not only to live among us, but to show us how to live. And show us how to die. And show us it was hope and death, for in you there is resurrection eternal. We know that you are the Emmanuel, the God who is with us, the God who knows best. And so when we pray this morning, we pray, Lord, for your will to be done. We think of these unspoken requests. We pray for physical needs. I pray for Lori this morning and her sister, and I, I pray, Lord, that you give them strength and give them wisdom and give them encouragement. I pray for their mom, that you would just touch her life and, and give her good days. I pray for the unspoken requests among us. You know what they are. Some may be physical needs. Some may be emotional needs or relational needs. Many may be spiritual needs. And we know that you are a God who is a healing God, a redemptive God, a restoring God. And we know that of all the prayers that we pray, that it is your will that people come to know you as Savior. And so this morning we pray for our loved ones that maybe this time of year, they will look into that stable, they will look into that manger, and they will see you differently. They won't just see you as a nice picture on the front of a Christmas card or a lawn ornament, but they would see you as the living, saving God that you are. Or they would accept you into their life. Lord, uh, we love you this morning.
pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Your Bible's with you. We're going to be in the Gospel of Luke, first chapter. Uh, one quick announcement. I forgot. Uh, ladies lift on uh, the 7th. Uh, they're having a lady planning meeting, and lunch will be provided afterwards. Ladies, come be a part of this with some great ideas for the year. Okay. Secondly, I walked into the prayer, mood, prayer room this morning. And uh, man, it just it kind of threw me back. I saw a bunch of guys in dark coats and top hats. <laughs> Thought I had gone back in time, just a little bit. And, uh, and there was Emily. And uh, Emily, you kind of reminded me a little bit of Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> so they were portraying the, the time of, of Dickens and uh, thinking of Christmas as past and present and future. Okay, back to the message. I like, uh, I like Rob. Rob was sharing this morning in, in Sunday school. I have been spending some time in the, in the Gospel of Luke. There is so much wonderful uh, material to share here in this powerful book, particularly this time of year. Uh, probably something that should be started back in early November and work your way through. There's just a lot of 
really good stuff here when we get into the, the account of the birth and life of, of Jesus. I, I feel as though I need to go to the first chapter and the first verse just to kind of introduce this message this morning because I, I need us to understand the writer uh, known as Dr. Luke. Uh, Luke writes two of the books that we, uh, we share in our Bibles. The Gospel of Luke, of course, named for him. And then there is the book of Acts. Both books he is, uh, he is, the, writer, he is the writer of. We have evidence in that here in the first paragraph, here in this first chapter. He begins saying that many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Do you ever think about that statement? The things that have been fulfilled among us. These individuals that we will look into that look at this morning, literally God's plan was unfolding in front of them. The fulfillment of his promises was being, uh, it was happening in that moment through these individuals. I believe God's still at work, still fulfilling his promises. He goes on to say, just as, just as they were handed down to us by those from the first, we were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theopolis. Now, I know that if you were here during the summer and, and you heard me talking about the, 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 uh, the book of Acts, uh, this word Theopolis literally means lovers of God. Uh, there are those that assume this is an individual's name. I happen to think it means that those who love God. This is to you, those who love God. Oh, Theopolis, he is writing to you so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. Uh, I like this morning that we were, we were, we were looking over the, uh, the, uh, the meaning of, of the Advent. And uh, one of the things that I, I, I do realize that when we come to know Christ, when he comes to live in our hearts, he begins through the Holy Spirit to open the, our eyes. Scripture comes to life when we have Jesus in our life. Now, that's not to say that Scripture doesn't draw us to Jesus prior to us accepting him as Savior, because it does. But there's something about knowing Jesus when we open the word that God speaks to us through his word. I mean, come on, he does, doesn't he? When you're reading his word, when you know him, it, it begins to open up, becomes more alive to you in your life. Luke is writing, I have, I have investigated these truths, and, and he's saying, I know that they're true, and I have wrote them down to, so that you will know that everything about Jesus is truth. Everything about Jesus is truth. He's not, he's not a fable. He's not something that someone made up to make everybody feel good. In fact, if that were true, some of the things that I read in the teaching of Jesus it can be very difficult. There are several things, several events that we could look at this morning. I want to look at one. I want to look at Mary and the announcement that she has been given by the angel Gabriel. And by the way, Gabriel, actually, we see him speaking twice here in just a uh, couple of chapters, just the first chapter, first speaking to Zechariah, secondly speaking to Mary. Gabriel is the angel. He's like, he's the angel that has the important announcements. When he makes an announcement, you better wake up and listen. I happen to believe that Gabriel is going to be the angel that blows the shafar. When I say the shafar, I'm talking about the trumpet, if you don't know. When the trumpet is blown and Christ returns, I believe that Gabriel will have that very important announcement. He is coming. He is coming. Gabriel is making one of the most important announcements that the world will ever hear. And he's making it to this young woman. It begins by saying, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy... God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, to a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. He was a descendant of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. 
The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. And I want you to hold on to that statement that the angel makes to Mary. The angel again went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Uh, from the very beginning, he is announcing his name, Emmanuel, the God who is with you. Mary, you're not alone here. God will be with you, and you are favored, and you are favored. We're going to come back, and we're going to look at what it means to be favored by God. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this could be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive. You will give birth to a son. You are to call him Jesus. Um, in the uh, Hebrew, uh, the word, the name Jesus means Jehovah saves. Jehovah saves. His very name is about our salvation. Jesus saves. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. She who is said to be unable to conceive in her sixth month. And then this is going to be a little confusing for some of you. Because you've never, if you don't have this particular translation, you have not heard it said like this before. Uh, I have to admit, I struggled with this phrase. But I, uh, I learned to appreciate and love what was being said here. For no word from God will ever fail. You know it as, there's nothing impossible with God. Which both will be true. But no word from God would ever fail. I believe there is some strength in that statement. For as we read just these paragraphs alone, there are several prophecies being fulfilled in this young woman's life. Several prophecies being fulfilled in this young woman's life as we, we, read, we read through this. No word from God would ever fail. And then Mary made this statement, I am the Lord's servant. Mary answered, may your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. I guess I just asked a question this morning of us all. How many of you believe this morning that God's word is faithful and true and that he will honor it? Amen. Everything that God said he would do, he has done and will do. God is faithful. We can count, of all the things that, uh, that we look for uh, stability in, God is the one that we can count on. He is always faithful. He is always there. Even when we don't realize that he is there, we know that God is always there. I had said to you that uh, I wanted to look at this word favored. He had, he had spoken to Mary, and he had told Mary what was about to happen in her life, which you know and I know, that if um, this young lady would come to us and say to us, this happened, you would look at her and say, yeah, right. I also want to back up, and if you read the account of Zechariah and Elizabeth, you would say, yeah, right. I mean, they were quite along in years. She was barren. Gabriel had spoken to her and said, look, you're going to have a child. Yeah, right. God deals with impossible. He is the one that makes the impossible possible. Yet he says to Mary, he says, you are highly favored. And God is with you. Now, you've heard me pray God's favor upon your life. I, I shared with you some time ago 
that that came from a, a dear friend of mine who used to pray for me daily. I think he probably still prays for me. We've lost touch. But he is a prayer warrior. He would pray God's favor upon my life. Somehow we get the idea that when we enjoy God's favor, that that means that we're going to be living this life of abundance. Hey, we're never going to get sick. Our bank account is going to be full. Our table is going to be heaping over with much. Everything in our life, everything that we touch, literally is going to turn for a lack, to gold. So we get the idea that when we hear someone say, hey, you're going to enjoy God's favor, that's kind of sometimes what we think that it means, right? And I, what I believe is that when we enjoy the favor of God, we are enjoying the presence of God, the living God that is with us no matter what we are going through, no matter how much is on our table, no matter how much is in our bank account, no matter how bad things are going at home. Things may not be going our way at all, but we are enjoying God's favor because God is present. Now, what Mary is about to endure is not going to be easy. I mean, somehow, somehow we think, you know, we read the story, you know, we, we, we look at the stable, we look at the manger, we see Mary, we see Joseph. I mean, I have seen some pretty attractive nativity scenes. But I want to tell you, it was not easy was not easy what she was about to accept into her life. It, it, it came with questions. It came with hardship. It came with abandonment. I mean, for the community that she lived in would want nothing to do with her. And remember, she was only pledged to be married. She wasn't married yet. In that culture, if exposed, that could have meant the death penalty. And we realize that. I mean, it, her soon-to-be husband was given the opportunity to back out. And then there was the journey that they were about to endure. Which I read the, even again this past week was a three-day journey by foot over very harsh and difficult ground. Yet the word says she was highly favored. Favored does not always mean easy. I have to remember that. How about you? And there, there are days that I just, I just got to remember it because I'm praying for God's favor upon my life and the work that I do, and there are times that work is not easy. Because we are favored, it doesn't always mean that it will be easy. But it does always mean that God will be with us, that we're not alone. Being favored does not always make sense. See, that's where I struggle. You can, you can ask my wife. She will tell you this. I got to know how long. I got to know why. I mean, I, I, that's who I am. Like, I drive people crazy. I drive my family nuts sometimes, like. Laura's over there saying amen in her heart. She's like, yeah. <laughs> Being favored doesn't always make sense. Again, just kind of refresh our memory. Zechariah and Elizabeth. Does that make sense? Why well, use a couple of old folks? 
They never had any children. And to use a teenage girl to be the vessel to birth the Messiah. Mary's looking at Gabriel saying, it didn't make sense. I've never been with a man. Zechariah's saying, you've got to be kidding, we're old. Joshua was saying, what do you mean, march seven times around the wall? Moses is saying, what do you mean take my shoes off? How are we going to cross that sea? None of this stuff makes sense. Does it? Until we understand what God is doing. You see, we have the privilege of, we know the rest of the story. But what about your story? When has God ever asked you to do something that did not make sense? How long has it been since God asked you to do something that doesn't make sense? No, I've got to confess, I hate when God does that. Because again, I'm asking, how come? What's the results? And then, then backing up, when, when, when I do finally say, okay, I'll do it, and it's not easy, but God, you asked me to do it. Why isn't it easy? You ever been there? Or maybe not. Maybe you ought to start praying, God, ask me to do some things that doesn't make sense. If you really want to get to know who God is, because here's the deal. Not only is it not easy, not only does it not make sense, but being favored always has purpose, and there's always a promise fulfilled. Even though we can't see the outcome, I am, I am 99.9% sure that Mary had no idea the outcome. I'm convinced that Joseph had no idea what their future would be. Every disciple Every individual in the history of the world that have followed the steps of our God. And God has asked them to do something difficult. I'm convinced that they had no idea what the outcome was. Until God revealed his purpose and his plan. And you have that aha moment. And you realize that it could not have been accomplished without God. Somehow we have the idea that God needs us to fulfill his plan. God's very capable of fulfilling his plan on his own. From the very beginning, God was in charge of bringing creation into being. God's capable of doing. Yet, God created us to be in a loving, unique relationship with him and gave us the privilege of coming alongside him and fulfilling his plan and purpose. We were just talking, we were just talking the other day about the church in this country that we, we live in. And there was a statement that was shared with me, and I've probably shared it with you, that this country is the only place in the entire world that the church as an organization can seemingly be successful without God. Because we have been taught how to market how to program, how to entertain. 
And when you start putting some of those things together, it naturally attracts people. And we think, wow, that's incredible because look what's happening there. And, and yet, sometimes when you go into those, those settings where it seems like there's a lot going on, God's not there. God's not even mentioned. To be favored doesn't always mean it'll be easy. It doesn't always make sense. But it always means if we yield to God, God has a plan and a purpose. And at the time, it doesn't seem easy. If you're, if you're one of those individuals said, okay, I mean, I'm known of individuals who have quit their jobs. I know a pastor, he's a, a dear friend of mine. This is back 25 years or more ago. He, he quit his job. And, and he was in an industry where he was making over 100 grand a year. And he, he went into the ministry. And, and I, I got to tell you, even though there are maybe some churches out here where you're making 100 grand a year, he took quite a pay cut. Yet he shared with me, he, he never looked back. He never regretted it. It was God's plan and purpose for his life, and God has used this individual uh, to lead many people into his kingdom. It didn't make a bit of sense, did it? I know of a general superintendent, I won't mention his name, but one of our former general superintendents is now retired. I guess he was such an exceptional basketball player that he had an opportunity to sign with the NBA. Can you imagine stepping away from that opportunity to pastor a church? And you're thinking, well, he's a general superintendent, right? You know that he started out in a little tiny church as a pastor. He's, a, he's still a pastor. He'll always be a pastor. He never regretted what he allowed God to use him to do. Doesn't make a bit of sense, does it? Our parents, Laura's parents, maybe Wanda, I don't know if she'll remember this or not. I've moved that young lady around a lot. Our first call to interview at a church was halfway across the country. And uh, I shared that with our parents. We had just had our first grandchild. They didn't think that was a good idea. It didn't make sense. Now, I'm a grandpa. I understand that. But here's the deal. When God called me to preach, it didn't make sense to me. I don't like being in front of people. I struggled in high school. It just didn't make sense. But I said, God, okay. If it's what you want for my life, then there are some things I won't ask. I won't ask for a pulpit to preach in. Never. I won't ask for a church. I'll simply just go and do whatever you want me to do. That was the conversation I had with God. 
Well, he showed me favor. I never lacked a pulpit to preach in. I've had the privilege of pastoring three churches in almost 30 years. It's been good. But it didn't make sense. He could have used somebody much more capable. I find that being favored isn't easy and it doesn't make sense, but it always has purpose and there's always a plan. I want to share two passages of scripture for you with you this morning. It's a part of this purpose and plan in the life of Mary. In Isaiah chapter 7, I don't think we have read this this year. Verse 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And you will call him Emmanuel. Didn't make sense. But God already said it. God's word, remember, will never fail. It will always come true. And I'll just keep you in the book of Isaiah. We'll go over to the ninth chapter, verses 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Hey, I want to read that again. You know, every time I read that, there's something inside me that jumps. It's, when you read the word, does the word like, you get excited when you read the word? I could be reading the word, I'd be by myself. And God starts speaking through his word, I just get excited. I mean, there's a whole lot of people excited yesterday, maybe not here. Because, you know, the black and gold one. I know, I see that. I had my doubts, but they, they got it. People got really excited at that game. People got really excited at Wanda's yesterday. I couldn't even hear myself think. It is nothing compared to verses of scripture like this. When we read this, it literally ought to do something within our spirit. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And in the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. I'm not a political man. This gives me encouragement because I know that there is a government in a kingdom that will be eternal and it is the government that we were intended to live in. It is a government of love. It is a government of peace. It is a government of God's love. It is a place where God's people can be loved and love each other unconditionally. That is the answer. No matter what anybody tells you, that is the answer. And Jesus made it possible. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, ever step, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time and forever. And the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. When God speaks, these are the words I leave you with today. When God speaks, it will be done. That immediately reminded me of something Jesus said when his disciples said to him, would you teach us to pray? And in a portion of that prayer in Matthew 6, 10 says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When God speaks, it will be done. There are certain things that God has already in mind, in place. We will not change his mind. We will not change his purpose. We will not change his direction. He's already said it. It will be done. He said that a Messiah would come. 
Messiah was born. He said that Messiah would live, that Messiah would die, that he would raise from the grave. And he said that Messiah would come again and he would take his church to be with him forever. I believe it. Some of you, I won't see till New Year's Eve. So I want to say Merry Christmas. Have a great week. I want us to be thinking not about what commitments that will make this year a break, but how close that we will draw to the Lord over the coming year. Let's think about those things. He has given us the greatest gift, the gift of, him, the gift of himself. The only thing that we can give him in return is ourselves. That's all. If you have not done that, this may be the Christmas to do that. Let's stand this morning. Father, as we, uh, we get ready to go and uh, celebrate in a variety of different ways, your birth, your life, the hope that we have in uh, salvation, eternal life, in your coming again to making all things right. We celebrate these things. I pray that in the midst of our celebrations, that Lord, you will not be forgotten, that you will be lifted up, that families will gather around Lord, and not just open gifts and laugh and eat together. But Father, we'd spend time in your word. Read your story. Tell your story. As we sang this morning, cry it from the mountains that Jesus Christ is Lord. I also pray your protecting hand upon our church family. Be with them. Go with them. Keep them safe. Bring us back together. And Father, we thank you we thank you for you being the Emmanuel, being the God who is with us. <laughs> even when things doesn't make sense, even when things are not easy, the one promise that we can count on, Lord, is you are here with us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.